This is the Entrepreneur Way with Neil Ball. Unlocking the secrets of successful entrepreneurs seven days a week. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Napoleon Hill said the power of the mastermind is the driving force. To discover how you can unlock the potential in your business using the power of a mastermind, go to mastermindunlimited.com. And now, here is your host, Neil Ball. Hello, everybody. It's Neil Ball here. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Entrepreneur Way. The Entrepreneur Way is about the entrepreneur's journey, the vision, the mindset, the commitment, the sacrifice, failures and successes. I'm so excited to bring you our special guest today, Heather Havenwood. But before I do, I'm just going to give a quick quote for you. Anne Rice said, I'm always looking and I'm always asking questions. The Entrepreneur Way asks the questions so we all get the insights, inspiration and ideas to apply in our business. Heather, welcome to the show. Are you ready to share your version of the Entrepreneur Way with us? Thank you very much. And I love Anne Rand. She's amazing. Yeah. Great writer. Mm. Great person. Yes. I mean, never met her, obviously, but amazing quote. Thank you. Heather Havenwood is the CEO of Havenwood Worldwide LLC and Chief Sexy Boss. She is a serial entrepreneur and is regarded as a top authority in internet marketing, business strategies, and marketing. She is also the author of two dating books. In 2006, Heather started, developed, and grew an online information marketing publishing company from zero to over $1 million in sales in less than 12 months. She has produced and managed over 350 seminars and events and hosted teleseminars with many online thought leaders, such as Alex Mandosian and Joe Sugarman. Heather, can you provide us with some more insight into your business and personal mm. life to allow the listeners to get to know more about who you are? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's always weird to hear someone's bio, you know? <laughs> <laughs> always like, oh, is that me? Um yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. it. Entrepreneurship, I think, is I like I love your podcast name, Entrepreneur, because it's really a journey. That's how I consider it. And I think that um, w- I just wrote an article on LinkedIn. It's going to come out probably in the next week or two. And it's basically about that entrepreneurship is a journey, but not being a, so esoteric about it is that for me, I guess I love I'm a glutton for punishment. Over mm-hmm. a period of time, I constantly kept going back to the corporate world and kept getting fired. And uh, I've been fired, I think five times wow. and almost all my jobs. Yeah. And it's always like a loving firing. Like we love you. And, you know, mm. uh, thank you for bringing us revenue and always kind of, uh, when I got fired, it always confused me because I was always a good employee. I always, um, brought in revenue for the company. It, it's just the the challenge was, is I always kind of butt heads with the managers. Cause I was like, why would you do so that? You know, what, the better way to do that is this. And they're mm. like, you can't, you can't do that with the managers. I'm like, what, why not? You know, kind of like Anne Rand, I constantly, ask questions and I constantly want to kind of move move the line. So today I'm an entrepreneur. I work from home. I work for myself. Um, I, manage a lo- I manage a few businesses online, a um, couple businesses online, as well as create, as well as manage, as well as kind of co-produce with somebody else. So I have a couple things going on, but mainly I you know, run full time online marketing from home. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what my world looks like here in Austin, Texas. Yeah, you look like you're very busy. So, yeah. what do you enjoy most about what you do? Wow, um, being able to work from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's one of the uh, beautiful advantages, being able to create the lifestyle that I want to. But it's work. You know, I do a lot of work. But actually, one of the m- major things I love to do is actually helping people. So that's the space I'm in now is the last year I've been outwardly seeking potential clients that I could work with. that can Mm -hmm. say, okay, you know, I've done this work. I'm still managing these businesses. I want to help you do what I do. Mm -hmm. So that's the part that I really am enjoying right now uh, with working with my clients. Right. Okay. And what is it that drives you? What drives me is, believe it or not, to expand the reason I love entrepreneurship is I'm constantly expanding who I am, mm. uh, what I know. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly creating. And actually, I was giggled when this question came up was it's one of the things that drives me is staying away from the cubicle. 
Yeah, I got the idea that you, know, you either move towards something or away from something, as uh, Tony Robbins always says to us. And honestly, one of the things that drives me is to stay away from the cubicle. Yeah, I think we all want to do that, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you relax when you're not doing all of the things you're doing and you just seem so incredibly busy? Thank you for that. I really love, and I think I learned this from Dan Kenny. I love watching stories. So nowadays we have this thing called Netflix, right? Yeah. Where we get to watch a series all at once, you know, uh, gorging. I love doing that. Actually, I love watching the stories develop. Um, you know, of course, Game of Thrones. I love the story. I can watch it over and over again. Not about just the overall arc, but like the intricacies of the journey of each particular character. Mm. As well as like right now, I'm kind of going through, believe it or not, I'm going through The Sopranos. I never really watched The Sopranos from the beginning. Yeah. Um, because at the time of my life when it was airing. And so now I'm like going through The Sopranos. And, you know, I love, I love the main guy, Tony. He's such, not only a bad A, but... He's an entrepreneur. I mean, that's what entrepreneurship is, you know, mafia mm-hmm. or not. It, it's he drives business. The whole point of the quote unquote mafia uh, is to make money. You know what I mean? Now, of course, they have different ways of doing it that aren't legal necessarily. But if you look at the the essence, he's a CEO. You know what I mean? He's so CEO of these guys. So I actually love that. Um, I love that right now. I'm on season three. and I'm, I started from the beginning. So that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I'm doing in the back of my brain because I'm also thinking about copy. I'm constantly thinking about, oh, I could use that in copy and how does that character, you know, revolve around this? I mean, it's, I guess I'm studying on other entrepreneurs all the time. You sound like you've been listening to Dan Kennedy too much. Yes, yes. <laughs> I listened to him a long time ago. So I, I do love Dan Kennedy. It's about, you know, I think, um, and I, I laugh about it, but honestly, I find inspiration inside of watching other people, mentors. But the mentor doesn't have to be someone we know. It could be like a Tony Soprano. Of course, mm-hmm. we all know he's a character. But really, there's essences of, of Tony, you know, that in the Sopranos, that I could like, you know, that's a good quality. You know, you mm-hmm. could pick up on her. Oh, I could use that in a particular situation. Obviously, not killing people. But you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. can you can learn from characters, Mm-hmm. Um, I think, and I think that's what Dan Kinney constantly points to, and yeah. I love about it. Yeah, I think that's a great segue to my next question, which is, what entrepreneurial role models do you have? Joe Sugarman. Joe Sugarman is a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, he also wrote the forward to my book, but he has just been really such an inspiration. And you know, he's if you don't know who he is, or someone listening doesn't know who he is, wow, he's um, he's kind of I call him, and he kind of calls himself. Other people call him the grandfather. He doesn't call it himself actually. Other people call him the grandfather of copywriting. Before even Dan Kennedy, you know, um, he's he's the CEO and founder of. Blue blocker sunglasses. He's got an amazing story of how that happened, and his journey, his story, his journey is pretty amazing. But he always, he's always taught me. Um, he always says to me, Heather, everything happens for the best. Everything happens for the best. And when he first told me that, of course, my brain was like, everything happens for the reason, because that's what I was told when I was a kid, and which is the worst thing you could tell anybody, especially kids, because we look for the reason. Like if you skin your knee or something really bad happens, right? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? What's the reason? What's the reason? And his flip on it was everything happens for the best. And it's like whatever happens, good or bad, there's something else, you know, that's that's kind of driving that. Um, higher spirit, heavens, whatever you want to call it. But like everything happens for the best. And I believe that because I went through a massive bankruptcy. I went through a massive foreclosure, went through hitting my head on the wall, literally, and just uh, losing everything. And promise you, I asked a thousand questions of why it happened. But now it's like, you know what? It happened for the best, and it did. Mm -hmm. Um, It really kind of brought me to where I'm at today. So yeah, I can understand. He's definitely an entrepreneurial model for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you ready to take your mind back to the time before you were an entrepreneur? Oh, sure. Um, Let's do it then. (laughs) (laughs) Those happy times in the cubicle. (laughs) Star Wars, you know. So what difficulties did you have to overcome when you started your business? Thanks for that. I mean, I've, you know, it's not like I've overcome them. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I look at it. I'm still dealing with them. Um, I think as entrepreneur, we're constantly dealing with them. The biggest one is implementation and distraction. And um, I still to this I, still to this day have to kind of turn off things and not listen to 
there's a lot of noise, you know, especially social media, there's a ton of noise out there. And there's a question that I put everything to, and that is, does this feed my confusion or strengthen my clarity? Mm -hmm. And I put that question out to everything. There's power in that question. Does this feed my confusion or strengthen my clarity? I put that to before I buy a Udemy course, before I buy, um, you know, ice cream. Like it's, it's, I put it to everything because either things that we're doing, okay, or buying or doing are taking us forward or taking us backwards, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's with conversations. That's, that's with relationships too. And so that's what I do now. But I promise you there was definitely a period in my life that I was spinning in circles and I constantly was questioning everything and um, I didn't know which way to go. I just knew I had this dream but I had no way to get there. I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing I've had to overcome. Okay. And did you have any doubts that delayed you starting your business or, or oh, starting yeah. that journey? I still, yeah, I still have doubts. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we like, all? I'm going to do this thing and I have to ask a thousand people. That's one thing I'm learning. I have a, I have a coach and she's really helping me with like, okay. Because I, I go to her and go, okay, you, you're going to tell me. And she's like, I'm not going to tell you. You've got to, you know, she tells me, you've got to learn to, go inside yourself yeah. and look for answers for yourself. And that's so challenging because I want her or somebody else to tell me it's okay. And then I go do it. And if it fails or does well, I can blame it on them. And that's a really challenge. I think for any entrepreneur, here's why we're, especially, you know, in, in the States, but also in UK, we're taught, you know, from age uh, six to whatever, 18, we go from, you know, grade one through 12, at least if not going to college and we're taught you can't do anything unless you ask the teacher. Yeah. You know, and then entrepreneurship is all about do it. And then if it fails, you got to take responsibility. Right. Mm. So it's a total mind shift. And that's a really hard one because we're taught so many years at a very young age. Like, don't do that. Don't. Did you ask the teacher? What did the teacher say? Do what the teacher says. And so I think that's the biggest challenge of a lot of entrepreneurs. We have to let all that go and be uh, be rebels, oh, yeah. constantly rebels, disruptive thinking. Disruptive thing, yeah. I mean, Uber. I think of Uber. We're here in Austin, and Austin's having this constant. I mean, Uber's all over the you know globe at this point, but they're uh, Austin right now is the number three city for them, meaning meaning the most uh, you know revenue, top three city mm -hmm. for them. And so they're and they're constantly battling. And I I love Uber because it disrupted. I mean, it really disrupted this city. I love it. I mean, personally, I love Uber. But I find it fascinating how this little business, a little app, disrupted. You know, the city council here. I mean, they're just bomboggled. Like, how do we control this company? How do we make money from these guys? And I just find it, I mean, for me as an entrepreneur, I just giggle. And I'm like, oh, you guys, because you can't control it. You're pissed, you know? Yep. And so um, I just, I forgot the name of the guy who owns it. I should know it, um, who founded it. But I just love the disruptive thinking mm -hmm. that it did. Yeah, that's it's, it's, it's a great thing. So what mistakes did you make that slowed your journey? Mm, not trusting myself, kind of going back to what we just said, but yeah. uh, not trusting myself and not being really clear, mm -hmm. okay. you know, staying in the confusion. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the things that you did before you started your business that would be helpful tips for some of the listeners who haven't yet taken that first step of the entrepreneur's way? Get a coach, get a coach, get a coach, get a coach, get a coach. Um, yeah. my, I kind of a story about how I call my dad dumped me when I was 25 and I had to get a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it's kind of a funny, but my dad's a business coach. And I remember I called him when I was like 25 or 26 and I just got fired from my big corporate job. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to do. It's just, you know, I was really confused about life at this point. And he said, okay, I'm done. Uh, you need to get a coach. I'm out, you know, kind of thing. And Oh, you don't love me. It's your job is to like mentor me as my dad, you know. And honestly, I, I got to give him some credit. It took me a few years to forgive him on that. But I, I got to give some credit because really he was right. I needed a third party. He's too connected, you know, yeah. parents, friends and aunts and uncles. They're too They're family. Mm -hmm. They've known you since you're a kid. A, a coach sees you for what you say you want. OK, not mm -hmm. what uh they remember you when you did your six, you know, mm -hmm. they see another part of you and they hear your goals and they help you get there. So honestly, I did. I got a coach when I was about 25, 26, and I pretty much had a coach since then. Mm -hmm. I, do, I remember rightly, you, you do coaching as well, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So and now I coach, right? So the so, coach has a coach, and she coaches yeah. herself. Oh yeah, I think, yeah. I awesome. mean, I rumors are Oprah had a coach. I think oh Tony Robbins has four or five coaches. I think yeah. every great person out there has a coach. The president has multiple advisors and multiple coaches. You know, Bill Clinton actually one time called Tony Robbins. I mean, real people that are up to big things in life yeah. have coaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think not. Uh, people don't always realise that, do they? I think, especially in business, yeah. I think people think, "Oh, well, I'll figure it out myself." But sometimes it's just quicker to have a coach who's going to guide you and and give you a different perspective and things, isn't it? So, yeah, because I, I think honestly, I'll just speak for just a second. As coach is not an advisor, you know, you have lawyers or advisors, but a coach is someone who really makes sure that you're tapping into your higher self in a way and saying, "Well, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think? You mm-hmm. know, like." No, give me the answer. No, what do you think? <laughs> you know, no. So I think that's a better, um, it, it's really helped me through my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, good. So knowing what, what I wanted to know is I want to move forward to that entrepreneurial journey, Heather. So knowing what you know now, is there anything that if you'd known it when you started out would have helped you to shortcut the learning curve? Yes, fail fast. Mm. Fail fast, meaning um, when you get an idea, if you like your guts, like this is the idea, go for it. And you, you're like, there's what I call, uh, you know, you got to sit on ideas for a little bit of a time. What I call incubate. That's what yeah. Joe Sugar tells you. You got to incubate an idea, mm-hmm. you know. And when it's like it's there, you got to act, act, just implement. And if it's not the right, what I call um, avenue, mm-hmm. it'll show pretty fast. Like it'll come apparent. Not that it won't ever have um, walls, but it'll become apparent if you're on the right track or not. Makes sense. You're going to still come up with walls on things that you're on the right track. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing is implement. And uh, there's a, I'll tell you a story in that is a couple of years ago in the middle of my bankruptcy, right? I was going through all that. It was really a bad time. And I was at a retreat, an entrepreneurial retreat in Florida. And I had a dear friend of mine, Bill, and we're sitting there. And he's doing some coaching. I mean, I'm crying. I'm all upset. I'm like, the bankruptcy or whatever. <laughs> and he's like having none of it, right? He's like, ah, shut up, you know. And um, he makes me get a piece of paper. And he gives me a pen. And he goes, okay, now write this down. And basically what he had me write, he said, I, Heather, give myself full permission and full license to fail. And I'm writing it and I am just in tears because I really realized that was it. I never gave myself permission to fail and fail and fail and fail because that's what entrepreneurship is. It's fail, succeed, fail, 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 succeed. I mean, Joe Sherman always told me that the reason why he's so successful is because he's failed a lot. I get that. I have failed a lot. I failed a lot. But it was up until that point, I never gave myself permission to fail. So I was so scared to get back up again, you know, get back on the bike again. Um, And that kind of gave me that permission. And that was the moment I realized not only that, but also from a very young age, because I'm driven, I never wanted to fail. You know, and so in school and in college, I didn't want to look bad. I didn't want to look like I failed. And then here as an entrepreneurial journey it's like okay now go fail go fail go fail until you find something that that works Mm. that's so counterintuitive so uh that was the that was the moment i gave myself full permission and the license to fail and i think if i could give that to people that's a that's a huge piece you got to give yourself permission to fail but you also got to give yourself permission to succeed because it's in the same it's in the same action Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of people like to play safe, don't they? They like to live safe. And unfortunately, right. that's not right. that's not this journey really, is it? Yeah, it, it really isn't. You've got to give yourself permission to fail and give yourself permission to succeed all at the same time. It's the same license mm. called the license to kill, but the license to go out and succeed. But it's a double-edged sword. If you give yourself the the license to succeed, you're also giving yourself the license to fail. And if you look at really powerful people, Donald Trump right now is in the news a lot here in the United States, so I'll just kind of throw him up. Okay. Yeah, he's failed. He's failed. He's succeeded. He's failed. He's succeeded. He's failed. He's succeeded. You know what I'm saying? That's that's the journey. And he's okay with it. Yeah. You know? That's what people bring, bring up his bankruptcies all the time. He just kind of laughs it off like – part of being an entrepreneur dude you know mm-hmm. just kind of moves on yeah and then you've got to have the same viewpoint mm. that's awesome so how much does gut feeling influence your decisions in your business i know you touched on that before in your answer so be interested to hear what you think it is 
imperative. Mm. And when I put that question to everything, how does this feed my confusion or strengthen my clarity? That's the first question I put to it. And then I go internally Mm. where I just kind of sit with and I um, do some, I actually do some body testing and see if it's a fit or not. Because your body is a um, antenna really for your gut Mm. or for your higher self or however you want to, you know, tack that versus the ego. You gotta get past the ego brain and into the gut. And so that's how I do it as I sit with it. Mm-hmm. And I do some body testing. So it makes a it's I guess the question is, you know, how much do I do that? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Unquestioned. Yeah. Some people yeah. trust the gut and then other people don't the gut feeling and some people don't. So it's it's always I look at both. You yeah. know, I do do look at the what I call the the reality. You know what I mean? Like the reality, the numbers, is it gonna work? Stuff like this. But I don't discount the gut mm. and you got to be both you can't go all gut or or nothing you yeah. know i i do believe that because there's sometimes i hear things that like well my gut tells me i should go to south africa and do nothing for a year i'm like mm-hmm, do you think about that you know <laughs> so, mm, i don't know how that's gonna go <laughs> you know so you have to really have to think things through not just that sounds cool <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> you know Anyway. So, Heather, life is made of constant change, whether we like it or not. And I, I believe, and obviously other people have said this, that the only constant is change. So how do you try to keep up with change? Ooh. Okay, here's a couple of things I do. There's pieces of me that do keep up with change, and I'm constantly looking at what's next, what's next, what's next. But I keep this principle in my head that people, people – and how we purchase and how we buy, because I'm in the marketing, don't really change. Mm. The medium has altered, right? Sometimes we used to get in the car and then drive and then get out and then whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And we used to get these things called newspapers and find out what's going on. The medium has altered our mm-hmm. yellow pages, but how and why we buy as a human being, the emotional side of that yeah. has changed. Mm-hmm. So you have to you have to kind of uncollapse the change versus the human being hasn't changed that right, much. Technology is altered, obviously, and we obviously do things differently on iPads and iPhones and um, Amazon versus Walmart or whatever. But really, why we buy hasn't changed. So that's the thing I have to constantly, what I call, uncollapse mm. in, the, in the internet marketing world, especially because I'm constantly doing technology. Yeah. And you have to kind of go, well, is this something that's going to really have someone try to change? Because if you try to change somebody, it's hard. If you're trying to create a business or a service to change people, that's hard. That's a, what I call hard business. Mm. Okay. So you want a business that, People don't necessarily change, but they enhance. Yeah, it enhances them. So that's how I. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. If I just like to dig a bit deeper on what you said there, because something just fascinates me. Mm-hmm. I think that people have changed slightly, and I just, I'd just like you to explain why you don't think this is the case. Because if you take how people used to buy, say, thirty years ago, people were very much influenced by the adverts that they saw and they might read reviews in a magazine or something like that. So they were fed all this information from other commercial sources. Whereas now you get fed information, but people start to look for user reviews on things. They start to talk to the friends in Facebook and things and see what they think. Do you not think that is a change in people and to no, some extent? No, I know it's, I know it's, it's an effect of technology, same. but do you not think it's a change in the way people are to some extent? Because the, no. the less trusting of these commercial sources and more trusting of people that they know and user reviews. No, because it, no, okay. here's why. Because let's say back in the, let's go to the 40s or 50s, right? Yeah. I'm a housewife and I look at a magazine and I see something I like. I, I might go to my neighbor, Nancy, and ask her if she bought it before. What does she think of it? Has mm. she done it? I might go to my book club that has 15 of my friends from the neighborhood, okay, asking them what they thought or, or have they ever bought this or what, what are they using for that. It's the same thing as social media. The medium in which we do things has changed. Mm. We now go on Facebook and go, who's ever bought this? And blah, 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 blah right? Mm-hmm. The, the medium has changed, but the time-tested principles, okay, testimonials, emotion, moving away things 
moving towards positive and away from negative. These times time tested principles of marketing and sales hasn't altered. Yeah. We as human beings still seek reviews. We still seek testimonies. We still seek looking good. That isn't altered at all. Okay. It just the medium in which it's happening has altered. Okay. That's that's the distinction. And I think if you just time tested principles of marketing and sales, it's still the it's what I call the time tested human being elements of yeah. personal development. And that's what I mean by that that core hasn't changed. It's just how we do it has altered. Mm. I think I'm not trying to challenge you completely on this. <laughs> but <laughs> but if you think if you go back to the person from the fifties, they ask around the friends and they find that you know, if it was something like the iPod and no one had bought it, for example, then they're then left with a, a decision of making the decision on their own. So yeah. at that point, they'd have to rely on some other source if they still wanted further validation of their decision. Whereas now you could go to people, your next best thing beyond the people you know are the people you don't know, aren't they? Even in terms of user reviews and things, because you can get a good idea of what things are about. So I just wonder if it's still maybe changed a little bit. But no, because once those kinds of time-tested principles are what I call uh, the needs, yeah. once the need is met in the human being, like they did they get the answer, then they'll go make the purchase. Mm. The need is the, hasn't changed. The needs of human beings haven't changed. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, but it's the fulfilling of that need at some yeah, point. Yeah, the fulfilling's altered. Yeah. It used to be this magazine called Consumer Reviews, yeah. okay, where you would pick it up and you would go buy it or, you know, things like that. It used to be a Reader's Digest. I mean, all these TV guide. I mean, these things are uh, needs that we still have today. Now we just go to the remote press guide, right? Mm -hmm. So. Again, that's just a technology alterization, but the need of the human being is still – we don't change much over, over the years. We, yeah. we as the need of the human being – you know what I mean? We don't, we don't go to the bathroom differently. You know what no. I mean? Like there's not much changed. Yeah. It's just that um, what we're focused on has altered, mm -hmm. and that's based on technology. Okay. So yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> you you can have your own. I, I mean, I'm agree to disagree. I just no. I, I understand uh, what you say. I know. What, yeah. I understand what you're saying. I just I, I just poo pooing on you because I understand. No, what no. You're saying. I'm not. I'm not trying to. I was just. I just okay. interested to hear your perspective <laughs> because it, I thought it might have done. And it's interesting to. See, I suppose if you take it down to that raw need, then I suppose it hasn't. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> so what is your favorite book on entrepreneurialism or business, personal development, leadership or motivation? And can you tell us why you've chosen it? Sure. It's actually a book that's here um, on my desk. It's called The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. It's a small book. Mm -hmm. I read it over and over and over again. It's kind of uh, like my uh, war of art book. Or, or, yeah, it's a war of art mm -hmm. book, right. and there's actually art of war. Too. Art of no, war, art of war. There's, there's art of war is the sun shoe, and yeah. then war of art is the new one by Stephen Pressfield, which I, I just, absolutely love. That yeah, book too. I've just picked that book up. Actually, I'm about to read. Oh it. god, that book is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it really talks about what we're talking about. So that's a great one as well. I mm -hmm. highly suggest that one. Small read, only 120 pages. Yep. Same thing with um, the game of life and how to play. Florence Scovel Shin. She was around in the 20s oh. and 30s. And what she does is, I believe in what I call the laws of the universe. I believe that. I believe there's laws of the universe. It's not about religious. It's literally like laws of the universe, like how things work, mm -hmm. you know? And she kind of lays it out. This is the laws of the universe. And, of course, the example she uses, you can tell it's back in the 20s, you know, based on timing and, and, and amount of money and things like that. But the principles are still there. So I read that over and over again. I love that book. Mm. I shall check that out when I finish yeah, this one. Sure. Everyone, when you have a busy life, listening to audiobooks is a great way to expand your knowledge in the time that you may be doing other things, such as driving or going to the gym. We have a special offer for you of a free audiobook of your choosing. To choose your free audiobook, go to www.freeaudiobookoffer.com. As long as you've not already signed up, then you will qualify. Ever. What I'd like to do now is fast forward to the future and just ask you a few questions about that. So what one thing would you do with your business if you knew that you could not fail? It's a great question. I'm going to answer that. But I first want to say, if you go to Audible, my book is on Audible, mm -hmm. Sexy Boss, and it's actually my voice. I did not outsource the um, 
the do the I guess the voiceover, and honestly, I have to say that's one of the uh, most proudest things I have I've done in my business. That was the most hardest one of the hardest things I've ever done is a voiceover, uh, because there's there's writing a book, okay, and then there's talking about your book, but a a voice over a, you know an audio book is like every single word of the book like this you know and you, you can't sound like completely boring mm. um so i i actually went out and i did my audio book and the the producer the gentleman be the editing and producer tried to talk me out of it he's like i, I he actually said to me i'm not going to start you today i want you to go home and think about it and come back next week because i don't think you should do this <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I come back. I'm like, I'm doing it. And he just kind of had this, oh, God, you know. Um, but it took me almost six weeks. I could only go in wow. once a week for two hours, max two hours, sometimes only an hour and a half. And I would come home and just pass out. I was so exhausted. Yeah. Because you're speaking your book, which is also one thing. But if you even miss a word, you mm. know, you know, he yells at you like, you miss a word. Go back. I'm like, ah! you know, in your, in your ear, like these big headphones, you know. So anyway, I, I'm very proud of my book on, on Audible. So it worked, so, out, it worked out well in the end, I take it. It did. It did. I'm very proud of it uh, that I'm just up there. It's like, I kind of have this, oh, I did that. You know, that's my, that's my voice and my book. And I'm very proud of that. Good on you. So thank you. But you asked me the question is, what is one thing? Um, if you knew you couldn't fail that you do in your business. Oh, Mm-hmm. Ah, there's so much. Um, what I could do if I couldn't fail? Well, I think right now I'm looking at one of my businesses I'm looking at with my boyfriend is to um, uh, franchise it. Mm-hmm. That's way out of my comfort zone. So I'm a little skeptic on that. How do we franchise that? How does it work? There's a lot of questions in the franchising world. So that's one thing. If I knew I couldn't fail, I'd go for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right now, I'm still t- I'm, st- I'm toe stepping into that, like tapping, tapping into that. Oh, yeah. But that's one thing. If I knew, like I knew, 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 yeah. I'm not gonna fail. Boom, let's go. You know, yeah. that's what I would do. Okay. What skill, if you were excellent at it, would help you the most to double your business? Dude, I think I'm okay at it, but I I think I could be a mastery at it. There's always another level. Yeah. Of it is copywriting. I mean, I I study it. I do it. I'm constantly writing. I'm constantly doing copy. But if I could say one thing that I would want to be excellent at, that would be it. Mm-hmm. Copywriting. Copywriting. Okay. I mean, I study it. Obviously, Joe Sugarman and Tan Kennedy and other people, John Carlton. I just did a seminar in 2013. Uh, it was me. I was a headliner with Joe Sugarman. It's called Success, um, SuccessMagnetSeminar.com. Yeah. And it was Joe Car- John Carlton, Joe Polish, John Benson, Joe Sugarman, a lot of Joes, um, myself, yep. and a ton of copywriters in the room. I just loved that event. There was so mm. many amazing copywriters in the room. That's the one skill that I think could that just could double anybody's business. Yeah, someone else said that to me earlier today, actually. So, it's, But it's obvious, isn't it, really, because you've got to get yeah. the word out there. So, In five years from now, if a well-known business publication was writing an article on your business after talking to your customers and suppliers, what would you like it to say? Mm, let's see at five years from now uh, I would say that working with Heather she's an amazing leader um, and she has a way to help people move through the um, the walls of entrepreneurship and get to their success Mm -hmm. and there's results for that like people can see it you know I think people would like to to do that and plus I have another business called E2 Lab and it's all about health and I would love, they could never say it, right? But they would love for them to say, uh, there's this person, this person, this person. Ha- she's helped them get rid of all their medications <laughs> yeah. on uh, Big Pharma and uh, stopped cancer, you know. Mm-hmm. Of course, they can never say that. But uh, I would love for them to say that. We did have a client that lost 59 pounds in four months wow. and she has gotten rid of all of her big pharma medications and her doctors are all kind of bomboggled with that and her <laughs> blood work has come back normal for the first time in over a decade and they're all kind of bomboggled with that because she's not taking their medication and so that makes me really happy of course we can't say that too much mm-hmm. around here but that's what i like for them to say yeah okay thank you 
We are now at the part of the show where you share your three golden nuggets. So, Heather, what is your favourite quote and how have you applied it in your business? Well, I've actually already said it. So, uh, does this mean confusion or strengthen my clarity? But I'll give you another one. That's my main one. But my second one is never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. So, I never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. That's a key one. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. So you use that a lot, do you? I do. Yeah. Well, again, these were kind of given to me in a very low period of my life when I was kind of rebuilding. Mm. And I would be, um, what's the right word? I was being attracted to people that weren't great for me, you know, family, friends. And they were in my ear. You shouldn't do this. You should do this. Because I was very susceptible to uh, outside influence at that time because I was kind of broke. (laughs) And uh, I was listening to myself. I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust anybody. So I was listening a lot to other people. And when that coach gave me that, it really made me think about every relationship, Mm. you know. And sometimes those are people that are blood, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. Yeah. I can understand that. So when, just just thinking, you talked about your bankruptcy earlier. When when that happened, did you find yeah. that some people you knew on the way up still wanted to know you on the way down? No, <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> like crickets. Me, me. Yeah, no. Now there were a few that were there, and they're the friends to this day. Yeah. Um, but no, I think when I was when I was crashing, like the time there was about a year. It took about a year to crash it. You know, it's kind of an overnight, but then it took a year. A year to have the full crash. Um, yeah, there was it was disbursement. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, there was about two people in my life at that point that stepped up and were there for me. Um, but yeah, you really get to see who your friends are mm-hmm. and family are. You really see your friends. I asked for, for help with my family, and yeah, that was crickets as well. So I, I, you really get to see who our friends are not. You get to, you also get to kind of time test yourself too. You know, so, um, yeah, that's definitely a big one. That's that's when my coach gave me that one. Never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. What the hardest part for me with that, for me at the time, was, wow, there's not very many people that are part of my fan club. You know, mm-hmm. that was the, oh, my God, they're all part of my fan club. No, they're not. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, so you start to really look at, first you got to be a fan club of yourself. And then you then you'll try people to be a fan club of your of you and then you're a fan club of them like i'm a huge fan of them i mean i love uh, i love these guys so i'm a fan of theirs as well it goes both ways no you reminded me of something jim Rohn said where he talked about choosing your friends okay. carefully because make sure they're there for you on the way down and i just i just i just thought of that one so it's yeah you'll see who business partners are versus friends real quickly mm, good yeah Thanks for that. <laughs> okay Welcome. Do you have any favorite online resources that you could share with us that would be useful to everybody? Oh, you know, somebody asked me this before. You know, I'm actually part, I love LinkedIn. I mean, that's kind of a big one, though. Uh, Stack That Money, it's kind of an interesting one. It's a forum um, I'm a part of, Stack That Money. Mm-hmm. And mm, Canva, love Canva, because I, I don't like Photoshop at all. Mm-hmm. So those are just like little ones. Those are my ever infusion soft. I could use that. I mean, okay. they're, they're not that great. You know, Fiverr. I think I, I kind of am a basic girl when it comes to online. I mean, I'm kind of in, innovative, up. but yeah, Amazon. I love Amazon. I, I I'm becoming like an Amazon freak a little bit with yeah. Amazon S3, and then um, I'm obviously a seller on Amazon, and I have a lot of books on Amazon. Type in Heather Havenwood. I have about six books on there. Mm-hmm. I love Amazon. Love, love, love. So, Heather, what is your best advice to other entrepreneurs? Mm. Be clear on what you want. Okay. Be clear on that this is a journey and there is no necessarily end. You know what I mean? Like you can yeah. create the goal of like you want to sell a business or what it looks like, what you call a goal. But you have to realize that there's no end, that after you get that goal, there's another goal. Mm-hmm. And it's a journey. And I keep pouncing on that, but really, it's a journey. And if you think you're at the end of it, you, the cool thing about being an entrepreneur is you get to create again what's next. Yeah. 
and there's always a what's next and there's what's next. And I'll leave it with this is during my bankruptcy or after, or after my bankruptcy, I lived on an island for about a year where I, I kind of just stared off into the ocean, you know, for mm-hmm. about a year. And it was in Florida. And I had this kind of time of what the hell happened and what's next kind of for about a year. And I remember it was Marco Island. It was in Florida. And the average age on the island was 80. So there's a lot of retired people. Mm-hmm. But I remember, you know, sitting there at Starbucks, it was always busy because everyone was there doing nothing because they're always tired. OK, so you have to get that. Like, no, they, <laughs> it wasn't like New York busy where people are in and out, in and out. Now, this is called everyone's hanging out because yeah. there's nowhere to go. <laughs> um, and they, they no one was really into computers. So they're hanging out at Starbucks wanting to talk to you. So you could literally walk in there and have a conversation with a complete stranger at any time of the day. Mm-hmm. Um because they're all retired. And I remember that very distinctly because I realized that the men and women that were in their 80s or whatever, 70s, 80s, the ones that were still like they were business owners at some level, right? Even if maybe they'd given their business off to their uh, the next generation, they still were involved. Their brain was still going. You know, they're still involved in something. They were still in the business at some level. They were creating. They were still active at some level. Mm. They're the ones that were healthy. The ones that had these job, kind of jobs, corporate jobs or government jobs, and then they, quote unquote, fully retired. Um, they're the ones that were that I saw my view, they were uh, like dying off really fast, you know, like they were, it was almost like they had nothing to live for. And I really saw that. And I went, you know what? I get it. There is no end. You know, it's always an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing what's next. And if you have that in mind, then you won't get so upset, you know, and you also won't feel like, okay, I'm about to die off. I just, I think that's a key piece. I just saw that. The human beings, we want to see what's next. Well, we are beings, aren't we? We have to be something. Yeah. I think that's the point. And yeah. I think I think there's, there's there's quite a bit of evidence to support that, actually, from what I can understand. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure that's the case, that people who keep busy, the statistics actually show what you said there, in terms of people who it's, keep their minds busy are more likely to live longer than people who sort of feel like they've got this void in their life because they don't have to go and do the nine-to-five anymore. Right. And I, I don't like that word of like retire because yeah. it's like that. I, the people that came onto the island that were, quote unquote, really retired, meaning like the government jobs, there's nothing, you know, it's done, right? They're the ones, their health would slip fast. Yeah. But the ones that still had, even like I said, even if it wasn't their business, you know, but they had a family member in it, they were still involved. They call, how's it going? Let me give you some advice. They're kind of mentoring still a little, you know, mm-hmm. they're the ones that were still active and walking around and moving around and, you know, playing tennis at 80 and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. It was really fascinating to me to see the difference between a business owner who was retiring versus a uh, government employee who was retiring. It was a big difference in how they viewed life and how they were on a health level. It was fascinating. Their mind was very different. Mm, I can imagine. Everyone, if you didn't manage to get a note of Heather's favorite resource or her favorite book, you can find the links on Heather's show notes page. Just go to theentrepreneurway.com and search for Heather or search for Heather Havenwood in the search box. Heather, is there anything else that you'd like to add about your business right now? Sure. Thank you so much. I mean, I just would um, encourage you as an entrepreneur to get a to get a coach, a marketing coach, business coach, life coach, Mm -hmm. one or all three. And I'm a marketing and business coach. That's what I do. I would love to have the opportunity to potentially you guys look me as one of those coaches Mm -hmm. and uh, you go to heatherhavenwood.com and click on work with Heather. But if it's not me, someone, you know, someone to help you through the the mindset of, of what are my goals? What am I going to do? What's the first step in keeping you accountability for that because I know for myself if I didn't have my coach I'd be uh, I'd be I'd be in circles I'd be just like a horse walking around in circles you know mm-hmm. so that was what I would suggest and then for women you can check out my book at www.sexybossinc.com when you opt in you actually get three free chapters of my audiobook so I give you uh, three free chapters you don't have to go to audible Fantastic. If you don't like. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. And I just love the entrepreneur way because it really is a it is a journey in a, in a Absol- way. Absolutely. You know well, it's been an absolute honor having you on here. You've certainly given us some really insightful ideas and thoughts 
about the entrepreneur way and you've given me a lot to think about and I'm sure everyone else has got a lot to think about from it as well. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Entrepreneur Way. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball.